The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Zurich Australia Limited, ABN 92000 010 195 AFSL 232 510 and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hi, I'm Andrew Rocks from Ensemble, and I'm thrilled to be bringing to you uh, the podcast Engine Room. It's devoted entirely to the practices or the business of the business of financial advice. Over the course of the next many months, we're going to be interviewing Australia's best independent boutique advice firms, their practice managers, their GMs, on what environment is conducive to being a best practice how they keep talent, how they attract talent, and what the future of financial advice is. It's the Engine Room Podcast. Welcome aboard. Zurich is proud to be supporting this episode. The Zurich and OnePath Advisor portal is more efficient than ever before, giving you access to two leading brands with three highly sought after products, underpinned by two powerful underwriting engines, all with one simple sign on, making it easier for you to do business and perform at your best. Hi, I'm Andrew Roxon. Welcome to the Engine Room Podcast. It's a podcast where we lift the lid on practices to find out how they tick why they tick, why they're here today and being successful, and more importantly, why they will stand the test of time over years. And like all things, they're led by um, a group of motivated individuals. And today I'm privileged to have Brett Chateau from Pride Advice, flown all the way in for Adelaide to see me. Good morning, Brett. How are you? G'day, Roxy. Thanks for having me. It's a privilege. Uh, privilege is all mine. And, and, and what I love to kick off with is just a little bit about how you've come to be running Pride um, where you started and maybe sort of what you learnt in your journey to get here. Look, interesting. Uh, my story is probably not dissimilar to others. It, I didn't start off in financial services, uh, but I did perhaps start off investigating in financial services. Okay, now you, you've got everyone interested. <laughs> yeah, I was a detective uh, over in South Australia and um, I, I got king hit at um, – one night trying to arrest somebody, a couple of mates were behind him, and um, I had uh, my first seizure nine months after that assault. Oh, wow. So I went on a journey, and uh, I had no formal qualifications, having joined the police force effectively from school, um, and working in places like serious fraud and um, um, anti-corruption branch, I thought that if I had any more seizures, then I would have to change careers. So I went to uni and uh, did a commerce degree and, and graduated in corporate finance. Oh, but- Wow. And, and and so the, these seizures have been something that have been part of your, your life thereafter? They have. I'm on medication still twice a day. And I think my last seizure was uh, seven or eight years ago at work. Uh, I hadn't had a seizure for seven or eight years. And so I decided to, to stop taking the medication. And three days into that, I had my first seizure for, for that seven or eight years. So I'm back on it now. Well, and look, I, I, before this, I did a bit of research, and it was only literally last week that it was um, it was uh, the Epilepsy Awareness Day, and I believe you're a big supporter. So, absolutely. Um, so well done on that. But, but so then you've moved into um, you 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 finished up your career as a detective. Yes. Um, you did your university career. Um, we won't even get into um how how you spent three years with a bunch of lefties in um Adelaide. <laughs> um, but um, shout out to all the bunch of lefties in Adelaide who've now become serious business professionals. Um. <laughs> And what was the next step? Was was financial planning a an obvious move? Look, it wasn't, and no, I suppose it's it, it's probably not dissimilar to how young people are looking at financial planning today. At the time, I thought, well, I've got this university degree behind me, and what else could I do besides being an investigator? And look, I didn't particularly want to do accounting, um, the professional year, but I really loved from a, a commerce degree that I did the corporate finance aspect. It was like a, a different language and I, I really did love it. And I went to a careers night as a mature age adult and financial planning sounded like it could be a career path. And it just so happened coincidentally that I was um, part of a team investigating a financial planner in Adelaide at the time. And although I didn't like what had happened to the clients, I, I loved the the idea of helping people with their money. 
you're probably the first guest on any podcast that Ensemble has put together where you've come into the industry as a function of being on the other side and investigating, you know, wrongdoing. So, so, um, thank you for, 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 for sharing that story. It's, um, yeah, I hope you don't have to do too many of those. But look, history repeats. We only recently had a royal commission, and you must have just been there, going, "Well, you know, it just goes round in a circle." Look, absolutely. Uh, look, a royal commission is is different to a, you know an ordinary court um, in terms of the uh, the process. But um, look, it was fascinating to watch, and you know, I think it needed to be had. The, the the pimple needed to be lanced, and I think moving forward, we've got some blue sky now, and hopefully, we can become that profession that we desperately need to become. So you jumped into financial planning. Um, and did you, uh, this was in Adelaide, and did you start in your own practice day one or what was sort of the events that shaped you? Yeah, look, I, I just applied for a job as a, a para planner, um, no prior knowledge, and um, got a phone call. I remember driving down one of the streets in Adelaide and getting a call saying, uh, the, the job's yours if you want it. Um, it was a, a pay cut, about 50% of a pay cut, um, had some some young kids, a young family, but it was something that I, I wanted to do. So I Started off as a power planner for, for 12 months and, and moved into advice after that. So it was a good grounding for me working for a small boutique firm in Adelaide. And, um, yeah, I then joined the licensee that I'm still with today. And, but the, it, that Adelaide office got shut down. So it was at that point that I moved out into my own business. Okay. And, um, and what year was that? That was my own business. Um, was two thousand and three, the first of June two thousand and three. So we're we're twenty Coming years up young. 20, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well done. Congratulations. Yeah. Um, and when you moved into your own practice, uh, two thousand and three. From memory, that was just after there was a royal commission before the last one, which was a, I think it was a, a FAI Rodney Adler royal commission, and um, AFSLs had just come in. So DFP had even. I think they were teaching doing a financial plan in the syllabus. Yeah, and we had customer advice records instead of statements of advice. That's right. That's right. And so um, what your journey with Pride then, um, how did that look? And it's been 20 years. Has there been anything you look back and you say, well, that was a turning point, um, positively or negatively? The whole, the whole thing is a little bit of a blur. Um, when I started out by myself, it was just me. And I had um, maybe $12,000 of recurring revenue. And I had the opportunity to take a, a redundancy package or take my clients. And I took my clients. I opened up the office. And the, 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 the recurring revenue was enough to cover the rent back in 2003. So I had no salary. I had no idea how to run a business. I'd, I'd come out of you know a government organisation and, and being an employee to suddenly being self-employed. So it was it was a steep learning curve. And um, during that time, so obviously you've got more than twelve thousand dollars recurring income now. If a cursory look at your website, but um, over those years, you've really seen the industry go from, as you said, customer advice records. Um, through to where, where it is today. Yep. What what have been the this what was what has been the the challenging aspect of the work over those twenty years? Look, I, I think it, it's a it's a very interesting um, industry, which is now a profession. Um, you know, the idea of superannuation and the idea that it's, uh, you know for a large period of my time it's been quite I think political. Um, you've had your left and you've had your right. You've had the the industry super funds. You've had the retail banks buying up. Um, businesses. So I've been there for that whole evolution and uh, you know, they compare the pair and it always seemed to be attacking the advisor, um, but they were, they were directly attacking the advisor to indirectly tackle, uh, a, a attack each other. So I think a lot of the stuff that's come out from a financial planning point of view has been this, this competition for turf, for territory. Um, so it's been, it's been extraordinarily difficult to, to find clients and win them over. Once you get them, that's fine. But to know there's some sort of stat that only two out of 10 um, people have sought advice. Um, and so it's the eight out of 10 that aren't getting the advice or they think the advice is too expensive. How do you get them, even just one off, to, to make sure that they're, they're setting themselves up for retirement? And look, the purpose of this, uh, this podcast is that even if you've got a lot of advisors, if they don't have an environment where they can just do the bit they're good at, Mm. Which is just advising, and they're dragged into other aspects of of of, of the machine. Then, yeah. then, then that two out of ten probably looks a little bit generous. Yes. So tell me, um, this when we chatted on the phone, um, you mentioned that you've got a, a lady who's been with you for a, a, a dozen odd years, Genwa, Genwa, and, yes. and she runs operations. Yes. And and and, and you guys work uh, very much as a team. I'd love to hear, um, sort of how you guys operate and where where your your, your authorities change because you're sort of a job lot when it comes to running that part of the business. Look. It's really interesting. Uh, financial planning, it, it doesn't seem to have the, the, uh, the, the economies of scale benefit. The bigger you get, 
the more profitable you don't get. Um, you, you, you have people doing the same role, take wearing different hats. And when you start off, and, and like most firms, um, you start off as a one or two person practice and you grow and evolve. And the more successful you are, um, the, the bigger the team gets. But you have to continually redefine who you are and the positions you've got in your org chart. And I, I see it a bit like a, a sporting team. And, you know, as the coach, as the person in charge, you know, it's your job to make sure that the players are playing in the right positions to suit their skills to make sure the team has the best chance of, of winning. And by winning, I simply mean making sure that the clients are being looked after and getting value for money. Money. So you can't hold somebody in a role and you have to help them grow as you grow to make sure that they're, they're reskilling the whole time. And Gem was been with me for 13 years. So I, I was only just uh, last month I had a look at the, uh, the, the long service leave provision um, at Pride and um, it's, it's, it's a scary number, but I suppose the alternative wouldn't be any good either. So I'm, I'm glad that we've got these people that are hanging around for a long time. Well, it's a trade-off between attrition and, and, and long service leave and I'd probably take the latter every day. Absolutely. And the corporate memory that these guys have and the, and the, the, the thing is they, 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 they run the business on your behalf and they, they become shareholders and do things like that, but no, they're just as passionate and when you've got a great group of individuals playing together as a team um, now that's when you make magic happen you mentioned two things and you mentioned that these people run the business on your behalf I'm sure that we're going to get into that in how your business operates and also they become stakeholders in your business two two key pillars yes in 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 a scalable business and, yes. and can I ask um, for someone who started the business with the with, with twelve thousand dollars recurring earnings and would have had to fought tooth and nail for every dollar for the first five years how hard have you found letting go and and giving uh, people like again more authority of head of operations or or practice management look I think there's a lot of good luck uh, in in running a business and I, I set out um, with no intention of growing to any particular size I just thought if I could have a business where I become self-employed and I have a, a great life and I can sell something at the end that'd be great so I think it has been a lot of good luck um, that I've employed the right people um, and the, the people come along and I think it has something to do with my personality where you know, I, I am trusting um, perhaps with the police background I shouldn't be as trusting but but I'm, I'm, I'm a sucker. I'm easily won over, and and these people um, deserve to have the trust at the start. And um, you now, when they when they continue on that path, and and they become very very reliable, then you, you can't do anything but let go. Um, but it is it is harder. The bigger you get, you've got to take some hats off and, and fit some other hats on a little bit more tightly. And um, if you don't, that's when the wheels fall off. So you you need to do it out of necessity. That's right. And I think the word accountability. Um, is is one that that gets thrown around a lot, and I absolutely believe in. And you've, accountability starts at the top. Yeah. So knowing what to let go of, knowing when to dele- delegate. Yep. Um, and and who to delegate? Correct. Yep. Correct. Now on that, who? Let's let's have a, a chat about um, this business um, pride advice as it sits in twenty twenty three. Maybe give me a bit of a feel for the scale of it. Um, you know, where is it geographically? Um, the types of clients that you guys like dealing with. Yep. Um, and and uh, sort of any other aspect of how the business is, is run. Yeah, look, so we've got an office, a, a large office in Adelaide, and we've got a, a smaller office here in Sydney. And so we, we we have one advice team, and they report to the head of advice, uh, and that's across both both um, regions. We have a head of operations. Um, we have a head of power planning. So, so let's go through some names. We've got, yep. again, was your head of operations. Yep. Who's your head of advice? That happens to be me at the moment. Right. But I've got to wear that as a separate hat. Yep, and and power planning. Yep, that's Vicky. Okay, shout out Vicky. It's uh, it's it's uh, it's where he first started, as he as you mentioned, but he only lasted twelve months. So, <laughs> so. Um. And uh, we've got Dave as well, who's a, a risk specialist across both states. He's happened, he's in Sydney at the moment. Right. Yeah. And um, and and what's the scale of the business? Um, look, we, we turn over circa five million a year at the moment. So we want to get that to 25 mil over the next five years. Wow. So. I'm writing a note here. That's going to be talking vision of the futures, um, section is going to be quite big. And how many, um, client facing advisors are you currently? There are seven, seven um, yeah. across the two states. And we have a, a support team of, um, 12, um, in Adelaide and, uh, another four in Sydney. Okay. And roughly do, do, do you break those, uh, sort of the, the, the delivery of advice into, into pods or teams? Is, does an advisor have a responsibility over a certain number of family units? Yeah. Look, this is, this is probably the, the biggest debated question, you know, that we try and answer when I get amongst my peers too. You know, how many, how many clients is, is the ideal amount? And I've, I've seen it vary from, 
from you know, 60 clients to, to 300 clients. And so it depends on how you've set your back office up and what you expect your advisors to do. So, you know, we have advisors aligned to clients. Um, the, the, the client service officers are pulled. They're not, they're not aligned specifically to an advisor. We did have that. We moved away from that. We may go back to that. It just depends on what, what's happening at the time. So at the moment, we've got a, a pool of uh, support officers that support the collective advisors, but those advisors have a, a client base that they look after each. And um, interesting because some, some some practices have pulled, some yeah. practices have aligned, and some have indeed done exactly what you've done. What what was what motivated you to to move from an aligned to a pulled one? Um, look, it was it was because if you if you have a, a, a either an advisor or a support staff move on, it, you know it just seemed to be a little bit more tricky to try and replace that it was relationship. Clunky. It was clunky, yeah. and and it's not to say we won't go back to that, but I suppose you no, know, as things change, you no, know, we will change as well. But that just seems to be the sweet spot for us at this point in time of our evolution. And look, the, the, the one of the other purposes of this podcast is to get the best quality talent to get to the best practices in Australia, and it is a super tight yeah. talent market. It, it um, is. Like yourself, I started twenty odd or 30 odd years ago and um, you don't look it <laughs> thank you um and um it was easy i think at uh, sort of 25 percent youth unemployment and 11 percent unemployment across the board um you just had to wave wave a wage check in front of someone and they'd do what you say but times have definitely changed and i can't see it um you know making much of a, a regression in the f- in in the future no. Um, in relation to your sort of governance, um, I, what, what's the AFSL that you're operating under? Uh, look, we're, we're part of RI Advice and uh, you know, have been for that entire 20 years. Um, I think having a licensee, it's you now you can argue that it's a necessary evil, but if that's all you see it as, then it's probably not the right licensee for you. Um, it, it should be a real partnership. Then it shouldn't just simply be a cost in your expense line. There should be some benefit for that cost as well. And it's not just the the opportunity to operate as a financial planner, but you should get some some real benefit and guidance from your licensee as well, which we do, I believe. And clearly you've lent right into all of those resources and you mentioned that a necessary evil, but the ones that do it well give a lot more than the basics and, and that's testament. And um, mm. as I looked at your website um, uh, earlier, uh, you've won RI Practice of the Year for five years and then you picked me up saying six and I'm like, well, you haven't won um, web it- designer for the last year because they haven't put it on yet. We're redoing our web at the moment. Congratulations, Thank by you. the way. It's a, um, they're a really quality, um, group of, group of businesses. And, and what, why do you think, um, you've been able to, uh, continue to hold that status? Look, I, I pondered this several years ago when I was just trying to brainstorm one day about you know, where's the business going. And I don't think we do anything differently. We just, we just do what we promise we're going to do. Um, so th- there's nothing special in that, but if everybody is singing from the same hymn book and, you know, my advisors have permission to do what's in the client's best interest, the support staff have permission. They don't need to, to ask for that permission. They've got it. Um, and so when everybody's trying to, to, to swim in the same direction, um, it, it's going to work. And so I think that's the real key to empower your people to, to do the right thing. And so that comes through in the compliance audits, um, the fact that uh, everybody is, is holding their breath to see what the results are going to be. Um, everybody loves getting the, uh, the, 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 the compliments, um, from, from clients. And, and when we're doing things like movie nights, which we haven't done for a couple of years, but, um, you know, people are really looking forward to seeing the, the clients that they're helping over the phone, um, a lot. So it's a, it's a real, it's a real family. It's a real pride. There you go. Real pride. And you, you slipped it in there. It was seamless. Well played. Um, what type of clients, uh, do, do you target and, and are they different between your offices in Sydney and Adelaide? Look, I think there's a, there's a natural, uh, higher net wealth, uh, in Sydney. Um, but notwithstanding, everybody, everybody has families. Everybody has dreams and goals and kids they want to look after and their health and they want to travel and do things. So I think goals are, are fairly similar. Um, you don't need to make something that's relatively simple overly complex. So look, by and large, they are, they are similar clients. Other than perhaps the, the size of money they might have to invest or the amount of money that they've got tied up in their own home. Um, we, we look after people that, um, you know, the, the 30 year old looking for some insurances, um, with very little in super right through to the, the retirees or, or pre-retirees that are coming in to see us and whether they are self-funded, um, whether they need some part centering, um, whether they need a self-managed super fund. Um, they're the types of people that we look after. We've, we've decided that we're going to stick to financial planning. 
And within your practice, you've got a, a risk specialist. Yes. Um, and so does that mean if I'm an advisor and I've got a family coming in, that I work with that risk specialist on those clients? Is that How's that structured? Yeah, 100%. So you know, we've, we've, we've rolled out um, objectives and key results in the organisation. And so each, each advisor, every actual staff member, has a, a quarterly objectives and key results that they need to achieve to try and make sure that we're, we're, we're all lined up collectively and so some of the referrals are internal referrals so if um if a renee or a tracy um see somebody and there's an opportunity from a risk perspective um i would rather them refer that internally to dave um rather than do it themselves because they're not specialists and i think you know everything done right you, know, you have to really specialize in and then there's just I think there's been too much generalisation um, in financial planning, and to be a true profession, you have to be really niche in what you do. But as part of a larger team, you can actually then make sure that you're you're, you're handing over that relationship for a particular piece of advice to another specialist. And as a function of um, your comment there, it's it's very difficult to have a bunch of specialists when you've got a, a small team, and it's Absolutely. a lot of a lot of people that might be listening um, uh, today and, and they, they, they might be in a smaller team and there's nothing wrong with that but um, from what we've seen is, is getting a, a, an element of specialisation. Um, I'm seeing um, financial planners refer within their practice as you've just intimated. I'm also seeing other financial planning businesses whether they be in aged care or self-managed super fund or estate planning referring to each other. Um, and I think that's an evolution. And if we sort of strip it back to the, the, the medical industry, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that people don't want their GP to do their heart surgery. Absolutely. So, that's... you know, I think that that's the evolution. Um, but without quality sort of organisations, without yeah. quality practices, it's hard to have the confidence yep. to have those speciality. Definitely. When you when you buy yourself, it's 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 a lonely place, and I suppose you can rely on your licensee a little bit more. But if you're going to have you know just be you as the advisor and try and run your own license as well, I mean there are so many hats that you're wearing. You're going to do nothing well. You know, in terms of juggling all of those balls, you're going to drop them. So, I think it, you know early on, I mean it's great to sort of get a, a bit of a generalisation about where your interests and your skill set might lie, but then focus on that. And, and don't just grab everything or everyone just because you can, um, because at some stage it's going to come back and bite you on the bum. And, and how, how does the practice attract clients? Look, we, do, we have a lot of social uh, media campaigning. I think we've got a, um, 1,200 clients following us on uh, or prospects following us on, on Facebook. We do the LinkedIn type stuff. Um, a lot of it is just internal referrals. Um, we've got our, 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 our network um, of professional referrers and every quarter we're doing stuff with those guys and, and part of our job it's not just to help pride but it's just to help lift the the, the profession to make sure that people are seeing financial services and, and, and financial planning as a profession and so if people can come along to these things and just get an understanding a bit of a, a, an appreciation that it's not just superannuation it's it's lots of other things then they walk away and, and it, you know, it, it starts with them and then they'll make sure that when they're hearing uh, somebody talk about financial planning, they'll have a bit of an idea about what it is that financial planners do. And I think you mentioned earlier um, the advisors need to have the confidence that what they say they're going to do gets done Yeah. and they need to have the time to work with the clients um, either directly or, or in a relationship. So in, with that as a backdrop, how does how does Pride build its engine room to deliver advice, documents, re re reviews, etc.? What's what's the, the secret? Yeah, look, a few years ago, um, we decided that the way that we would would charge, we would unbundle. Uh, and I know there was a, a conversation around: do we do people charge a percentage base? Do you do you charge a flat fee? But but what I found was people that charge a flat fee, there is a somewhat of a correlation between the amount of money somebody invests and, and uh, how much that lump, that, that flat fee might That's be. That's a detective uh, coming out in you. <laughs> and it can change from year to year. And um, so I, I, for me, it, it just, it didn't sit easy. Um, for those that doesn't, that's absolutely fine. But we decided that we would actually strip it right back down to the basics and, you know, to, to actually have a file open like, like a lawyer does. You know, there's a, there's a cost to that. There's a compliance cost and a burden. So, and you, so there has to be a fee to that. And then, then it's up to the a combination of the advisor and the clients saying what they do and don't want in terms of the scoping. We then created, um, modules. So it's the, the core service. And then there's modules that we put on top of it. And if there was a, a particular module that we thought that the client should, we should discuss with the client. What would be an example of a module? Right? Um, portfolio management. Yep. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to have it in such a way that the regulator could come to us and it, 
whether someone was a, a fee-paying client for us, it didn't matter whether we looked after their money. So if they want to keep their industry super fund, but they want to have a, a, an annual catch up with the advisor, then we've got a, a charging mechanism that actually covers that. So for me, that was, that was a professional way of doing stuff. So it's not about rolling people's money over into a super fund or a platform that we can get a, a, our, our advisor service fee from. It can just be a check that's written out and on the basis the client knows exactly what it is that they're getting and what they're paying for and that the, they can turn it off at any time. If they want portfolio management, then we can we can do that. But it's it's going to be given back to the client to say, would you like us to, to look after your money or not? And here's the reasons why we think it is in your best interests, whether there's family aggregation, fee savings, things like that, professionally managed, or whether the client wants to stick with their, their employer fund. Absolutely fine with us. And, and having a modulized um, service offering, uh, which is also accompanied by, by a cost, allows you to be quite granular in, in the costing of the delivery of the advice. Yeah. What steps have you taken um, and has your, your, your team taken with, with Genoa heading it up to ensure that, that you can make the advice as, as, as palatable as possible and, as, and, and, and I suppose delivered at a price point that not only rewards the stakeholders in your team but yep. also the clients? So, look, people that, that want to have an ongoing relationship with an advisor, they're, they're going to have goals. Um, now, if that goal is a, 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 a goal around a, a portfolio management, well, then that's a specific goal. But we, are, we one of the other modules is strategic goals. So, you know, what else is it that you're wanting to achieve with your financial life? Um, you know, is it, is it being able to afford to travel every year and things like that? So by everybody understanding um, the modules that, are, that are, an individual client is on, it gives us the opportunity to to make sure that we're, we're touching those right points, that we, we, from a back office point of view in our CRM X plan, that we can make sure that we can see that we're delivering on those specific modules that the, the client is paying for, so we can be proactive around those things. And it's also a good conversation because at the, you know at the annual review, if it's if it's not a twice a year, if it's an annual review, then you can you can talk to the client about what you delivered in that in terms of a specific module for that prior twelve months, and then that client has the opportunity to to turn it on or off. Um, and I find you no, know, for example, Centrelink, somebody turns age pension age or they're about to, you call them in. Um, and, we do offer a Centrelink service, and so if they would like to pay for us to do that, to concierge it and, and be the conduit between them and Centrelink, we will do that, but it comes at an extra fee. If they want to do it themselves, they save that money. I, I don't think you can be much more fair and transparent than that. And is there any – so you mentioned a piece of technology um, uh, that you use X-Plan, but is there any other pieces of, of technology in your tech stack that allow you to facilitate this, this ambitious and obviously delivered um, aspect of a modular service offering right down to just – the pricing and the collecting of the money. Uh, look, it, most of it's 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 through Compay, through Xplan, through our licensee. So you know when you when you're charging out, you've got to invoice and it's got to get paid to to the licensee. So from that point of view, there's nothing that we don't deliver that gets paid directly to us. There used to be, but not anymore. And um, with with your actual advice process and 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 the the clients, you said you're pure play financial planning. Yep. When um, when the goals and whatnot get to a stage where they might need some other professionals, have you have you got a, a bunch of partners in in the individual states, or how does how do you manage those relationships? Absolutely. Look, we've we've uh, had four or five iterations now of our annual review. We have an agenda, and uh, that agenda has been built. Uh, layer upon layer, year upon year of uh, learnings, and so now we've got this this document now that we we use as part of the annual review process. And so anything that's identified that we don't do, um, we will capture that as part of the review, and then we will make referral recommendations to these people and talk talk to them about the importance of getting this stuff done, um, and then that'll become part of our our follow up uh, email after the appointment just to, to remind them to, to contact these people and for the for the reasons that we've discussed during the review. And a lot of this sort of operational stuff's done by the, the client service team, is that right? It is. So the advisor captures the stuff during the review process and then we, we then put it into the machine and, and make sure that it gets delivered in a timely manner and, 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 and is followed up through tasks. And you mentioned um, earlier that you, you, you take on a broad range of, of clients. Um, do you operate your own in, in investments? You do MDA, SMAs, or, or how do you deliver that side of it? Yeah, look, we've got an SMA. Um, we don't have any any margin or any clip put in that SMA. So if people want us to run their money, um, we're happy to, to, to run anything on one of our 
platforms that are pro- provided to us by the licensee um, or, or via the SMA. Um, and you know, that SMA comes with a, a certain pricing discount. So if the client doesn't want to be part of that anymore, then they, they, they've got to move out of that SMA. But we have the investment committee that sits down weekly and makes calls. And uh, you know, we send monthly updates, uh, video updates to all of our clients that are in that to talk about what's happening in the markets and some explanation about what we think you know, the future might look like for them as well. And which platforms do you do it run through? Uh, Hub24. We use a lot of Hub24. We, we look, we, there's probably not a platform that we don't use. Um, it depends on horses for courses. No, there is no default platform that we will use. It, it really is built from the bottom up. And so what, whatever the client's looking for, if it's an individual versus a couple, um, whether there's a combination of super and pension, whether there's kids involved, uh, whether you, whether you can you know, take advantage of family aggregation, all of those things come into play. And we spoke about um, earlier about uh, COVID and how, uh, you know, running a, a, a business in, in two states yeah. um, sort of really opened your eyes up to the fact that if someone's on a screen, they're on a screen. Yeah. Um, what learnings have you taken out of that experience that you've put into place? It, look, I think COVID was fascinating for, for a lot of employer and employees. No, pre-COVID, um, I, I don't think I was the sort of um, – um, CEO that uh, didn't trust my staff, but but it was through necessity that people had to work from home. And you know, my team is just amazing, as I'm, I'm sure everybody thinks that their their teams are. And and they they really did knuckle down. They they did the job, and it just showed us that we could actually not necessarily be in the same room at the same time and still get the job done. I think from a cultural point of view, it can be a little bit difficult, particularly when you're onboarding new staff. But when you've got that existing team and bond. Um, the fact that you can have that flexibility, what it taught me was that whereas previously um, offshoring may not have been an option, um, with the price pressures of providing advice in Australia and those eight out of ten that wouldn't seek advice purely because of the price, it did force us to look at offshoring. And whether somebody wants to work from home two suburbs away from the office or whether they want to work overseas – um, and you can reduce your cost to serve to the client. It was something that we needed to actually consider and that we, we took, we embraced. And later on, I might talk about how you've integrated, um, those people into a team. Yep. Um, because, uh, getting people to do discretionary effort is not just associated with the people in front of you. Yeah. Um, in relation to your business, do you have a board and, um, uh, do you have a board? And if so, sort of what's the ownership structure of your firm? Look, in 2015, um, I, I was only a young man. I was still a young man, but and but there was an opportunity. I'm supposed to do that bit. You've got to leave a gap. <laughs> Sorry, um, there was not. Oh, there, was, oh, there was something. There was a, 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 a niche that I just couldn't scratch, and I, I think it was evolving from that sole sole proprietor into a to a, a, a team. But it was where to from here. It wasn't that I had a particular vision or goal, but I decided at that point, um, I spoke with Paul Barrett. I knew Paul from, from his days at ANZ and he was starting up something called AZNGA. And so that really interested me, not as a, as a succession, although you know, I suppose by default that it did provide me with one, but it gave me the opportunity to really start to formalize my thinking and uh, my, my growth trajectory. And so it was just something that I, a path that I wanted to take, and so I do have a board now. I'm, I'm part of AZNGA. I have a board that over the, the oversees what Pride does. Um, I'm the CEO, but I present to the board my vision and strategy, the five year plan, and they sign off on that. So I, I've really enjoyed those quarterly uh, catch ups, setting annual budgets, and, and just tracking to budget and seeing where we're, where we're going. So I found that really, really good. And having that thrust upon you as as the leader of your business. How has that informed how you manage the people within your business? It was a completely different hat. At the time, you can say that you're a business owner, but you're not really. You're just the senior advisor and you happen to have some people that you pay and you all get together and have drinks on a Friday um, and someone leaves or you know, you've, this just forced you to, to, to grow up get a seat at the table and you no know, professionalize. So I think it's been better. It's a, it's a much richer environment. People know what they're doing. There's, there's, there's proper roles and responsibilities. There's delegations. Um, we, we do, we're forced to catch up and talk about what the plans are for next year and then deliver to those things. So having quarterly board meetings and to see how you've tracked compared to budget, it really keeps you on your toes 
And with that professionalism, you start to realize that there's no more than 24 hours in the day. And so you need to yourself start to, to really hone in and, and focus on what your best value is going to bring to the business by whether staying an advisor, seeing new people, uh, going and doing the shopping to replace the milk and the coffee, or you know, do you actually get on and, and run a business rather than being working in it? And having quarterly boards, you're only 90 days away from a self-check. Absolutely. And you're looking, you're looking at it every week and, and you're having check-ins every month. So everybody's having check-ins to see how we're tracking. So you can sort of, you can get some, some predictive analytics about you know, where you are trending, what's causing it, why you're off, off, off target, uh, and, and try and, and try and rectify it in time or go back to the board and say yeah, we got the, uh, the budget wrong. I suppose we can also dispel a few myths. I mean, um, before this conversation, you, you were inquiring about Ensemble and the types of people that are listening and is it a, a, a young sort of cohort? And I said, well, kind of, but not. It's, it's now really big. When you were at AZNJ or you, you worked with them, um, you were the owner. Doesn't sound like there's a succession plan here. It's eight years on, you're still here. So clearly you didn't do it as a way of exiting Absolutely the business. Not. And uh, I think the, the, the myth is that, that, that quite often um, businesses such as AZNGA or, or, or other owning groups come in and buy the business and then kind of try and uh, change the business. But what's been your experience? Yeah, look, I, I think for me um, – to, to not know that that line of work, you, you can be quite amateurish in the way that you perceive things. And if you think that's what's going to happen, then your perception becomes your reality. Um, I, I put myself out there and you no, know, I was, I was fiercely independent, as independent as you can be when you're part of a licensee. I know there's, there's problems with that particular word, but, but they don't get in the way. And you no, know, whether, whether I was going to partner with a, a large group like an AZ NGA or whether I was just going to simply go it alone. At some point, I had to formalise and I had to get a board. I had to do the things that I was going to do because if for nothing else, through inorganic growth, I'd have to go and get um, lending from banks and they were going to see the stuff that I need to do now. So either way, it had to be done if if I was going to grow. And because I was on a, a, a journey that was in growth, um, I thought, why not partner with somebody that can help me grow and be four or five times bigger than I could have done by myself? You're better off having your debt partner as your business partner than your, sorry, your, your equity partner as your business partner than your debt partner. Um, they both have very different motivations. So, um, look, shout out to all the great lenders in financial services. <laughs> you know who you are. You really help. Um, what I might do is just shift it up now to, to, uh, people. And, um, you've given us a, an idea of how you run your business. You've given us the history. Um, what, and, and look, even the word pride, I, I love that, that mm. word. And, and, and I suppose what's everything that's associated, uh, with it. Um, why do people join you and why do they stay? Um, you referenced earlier that people stay a long time. Yeah. Um, but maybe just go through, start with why someone would join you. Look, I think culture is, is really, really important. And, and what's your culture? Um, look, it, it's being very professional and, and having a lot of fun. Um, no, things are definitely taken seriously when it comes to clients, but no, we have, we, the, from, from a hierarchy point of view, I think it's, it's pretty flat line. Uh, we're all approachable. Um, no, I, I can make teas and coffees for clients as they come in. Um, so, you know, there, there's, there's, uh, a lot of, all, not, there's a lot of autonomy, but coming together, but I think it's just, it's, it's more the fact that everybody's empowered to make decisions. And so. And, and when you say everyone's empowered, do you have a, do you, do you have, uh, sort of people have obviously got their, their job description. Do you have like delegate authority where they're enabled to make decisions without cascading to yourself or, or how do you run the absolutely. levers, especially because yep. you're in two states? Yeah, look, absolutely. The, it's something that you should be reviewing on an annual basis in any case. And, and when you've got a growth trajectory, when you, when you're growing so rapidly and expanding and, and geographically as well, you have to be reviewing those things constantly you can't just have, have the same set of rules and and four years down the track and three times the size and it's not going to work so but ha- having that that view that whatever you're doing today could change in 12 months time when you sit down as a team you're not a dictatorship you're not telling people how to do stuff you're actually inviting them there is, there's a seat at the table we're all knights of the round table what did we do well this year what didn't we do well what do we need to plan for 
how do we need to change the way that we do things? And and having everybody that is passionate and an expert in, in their own job roles, they see things that you you don't normally see. Now, if you think of your business as a house, um, you know, if you're the CEO and you're walking through the front door and you think, oh, this looks all good, but uh, you know, if people are operating in different rooms, they get a different perspective of what's in the house and what's missing. And so, I think it's it's a really valuable thing to bring your team along a journey to help them shape um, what you do, how you do it, and why you do it. Look, I, I understand bringing a team along for the journey um, is is awesome, but is Pride a place where your team can get a share of the action? Absolutely. Tell me more about that. So, look, in, in terms of the AZNGA structure, um, we've been waiting on an employee share plan um, to come to fruition, which it now has. Um, we've had two um, of the the, 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 um, the staff join us from an equity participation point of view, and I think what I haven't quite nailed down is uh, – how long should they stay before they get given the opportunity? And, and not everybody will. I had a, I had a, a young lady, um, Katie, um, with me when I first started up, and she never wanted to be a, a shareholder. She didn't want to be a business owner. She just loved being an advisor. And, uh, and unfortunately, she passed away at 34 of breast cancer. Um, but that was, that was her lot. And, and she said, Brett, I'm just happy working with you, not for you, with you. And um, it, was a, it, was a, it was a great relationship. So there are going to be people that do and seek equity. And if it's for the right reasons, then absolutely. The, the problem you've got is if you, you allow people to buy in, they're the wrong fit for the business culturally. Um, because unwinding that can be quite difficult. So you know it, it's slow and steady, but uh, there is no keeping all the cards close to your chest. You want to bring people along the journey. And historically, whenever equity is spoken about or ownership um, – Typically, it's always been the advisors are in line for equity. It's been a, a real sort of carrot to retain and attract advisors. But is rewarding other people in other roles in your organisation something you've either done or is on the on the horizon? It, it absolutely is, um, and it, that's the thing about a financial planning business. The financial planners, you know, they're obviously key to the to the to the relationships. But it's amazing how much the clients. Um, engage and interact with your support staff. And they are the real keys to, to a, a financial planning business for me. If you are the sole proprietor and it's just you and a receptionist, I, I get all of that. But when you, you start growing, you need to build those relationships and it's, it's, it's one to many. So that one, that one client has many relationships and those relationships are quite key. And so when they've got that ownership, that, that pride and that ownership in the business, um, they're more inclined to make sure that they're doing the right thing. Um, but they've got to show it first. Now you've, you've got to, you've got to behave like a business owner before you become one. You mentioned earlier about um, COVID. You mentioned, and, and we, we've discussed that you've got multiple sites. Um, is there any piece of technology that you use? Um, whether it be an MS Teams or, or something like that, where, where, where people can talk together electronically? Look, we use Zoom a lot. Zoom uh, chat? Yep, yep, yep. So we use Zoom. Um, and it's, it's really interesting. Even in, even in Adelaide now, you know, you can have three or four staff working from home on any given day. So you're not always going to have everybody in the office at the same time. So whether it's Adelaide, whether it's Sydney, there's, that's not really an impediment anymore. We're so used to, to having those meetings online that even clients now, uh, doing that, so uh, you know, having Zoom rooms um, in the office, making it look a little bit more cool, um, is a good thing. Um, Zoom rooms roll off the tongue. It's it's a pity that Skype didn't somehow figure out to name themselves differently. <laughs> yeah, I don't, yeah, I think I, I did use Skype a little while ago, but uh, yeah, just I think everybody's a Zoom expert nowadays. They're a bit like stonewashed denim. They're a bit of a relic, but um, <laughs> God love the shareholders of, of Skype. Um, how do you? With with the with your team, and you mentioned you, you've got the, the dual role of head of advice. Um, what's the meeting rhythms? So, if I'm working in your business, what do I expect? Do I get do I get uh, weekly meetings? Do I get quarterly meetings? You mentioned that you at the top have structure as a function of of of, mm. of the the board. Yep. But but how do you then create a sustainable ongoing rhythm in the business? So on, on Monday morning, have uh, management meetings. So the heads off uh, and myself will get together and we'll talk about the week that was and the week that is coming, um, what needs to be done, whether there's people that are going to be sick or away, whether things have popped up, um, whether we've had any any particular emergencies that have, have, have cropped up. And on a Friday, the advisors will get together with the heads of and, and talk about um, the, the, the workflow, what's happened, how many new people we're seeing, how many plans are being implemented, how many are in the pipeline. 
uh, any any feedback um, to, for any of the team members so the heads off can take that away, those learnings or, or accolades, um, just to, to, to pat people on the back or say, look, they, we think we can improve this particular process. Um, so there is there is a it's it's a fairly f- inflexible flexible structure. So whether it happens on a Friday at one uh, thirty or whether we roll it across to the next week because we we had uh, a catch up prior, what I do like is uh, I like to be able to say to a client that uh, the advisors will get together. And they'll talk about your situation. And I have, I've got a son that's got a thing called primary sclerosing cholangitis. And a client said to me once, it's a liver disease. And uh, he hasn't needed the liver transplant yet, but he's got a liver specialist. And a few years ago, uh, he was unwell and had to get taken to hospital, ICU. Um, and his specialist uh, was overseas at a, a liver conference. And the client said to me, oh, God, that would be frustrating as a parent to have your specialist not there. And I said, no, not not, not at all. Um, the world's not going to come to Adelaide. I, I would rather my my son's specialist fly to Canada, be there with the leading liver specialist around the world and bring that expertise back to Adelaide. And so you know, having the advisors get together to talk about a client's situation, and, you know, it, it's not just a story. It, it, you know, you've got all these minds talking about different ideas or different strategies that you take into account. And so, you know, there's a real benefit there is that there's a real, that real pride, the team that uh, you're going to have a, a collection of people working on your situation. And look, I imagine having the modular structure means that people know what they have to do, but they also know the bit that they don't have to do, which is quite powerful. I yep. imagine. And so that's where the, you know, we, we do have a, we do have a shared um, Excel spreadsheet where we put the referrals in into that, but we also then will talk about it um, in you know on that Friday meeting about anyone that has referrals for a, for another in house advisor, or even external. We've had um, we've had some external referrals come into us for aged care. That uh, we've got Renee who specialises in that in Adelaide and, and Kay in Sydney, um, but we've got other advisors that are referring into us, which is fantastic from other practices. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I, I do see a proliferation of that. There's yeah. um, um, and and that just goes to the point of putting the client at the center. Absolutely. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean the center of just your practice. No. It, it, it's the center of, of, of um, I suppose, meaningful advice. Yep. And, and you know, that's the professionalism aspect yep. of the industry. Yep. Um, how do people uh, – so do you do you have much organic growth? So do people start in your practice as you did and they start as associates, they move to power planning, advice? Is that a, is it a well-worn path? And that's the first part of the question. And how – is that going to reconcile with your ambition of 5Xing from here? Yeah. Look, it's a really good question. Um, a few years ago, um, we had a, a young lady, Talia, that wanted to do her professional year, and we were just not in a position um, to put her through that at the time. Um, fantastic uh, young lady, and um, she went with my blessing and went to another financial planning firm. She's done her PY and she's off. We are in a position now where we would put people through a PY, and we've got some some people that are doing their studies at the moment, not ready to do the PY yet, but as soon as they are, they will go through. So I think we've got an obligation um, to the profession to make sure that we're replacing the older advisors um, that are just through natural attrition. Every every organisation has it. I mean, the police department. I see a lot of coppers over in Adelaide, and um, the amount of police leaving versus the ones that are joining, it's it, no, it's it's quite dire. So we've got the same in financial services. We've had pretty much a halving of financial planners. It's where is this next generation of relevant providers going to come from? And if if unless you're going to go and poach somebody else's, you know, you should be putting young people through this. It's a, it's a real profession, and it's an exciting time in our in our evolution. And I think um, let's hope that more than just other advisors listening to this, and that that's a, yet another example of 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 the lunacy of, of where we've found ourselves yeah. as an industry with with, with increased demand. Yep. Um, how do you have fun? Uh, I like to ask this. You know, it's um, uh, and and look, how do you have fun given that you're in two geographical locations? Do you guys physically get together? Or actually, you're in three because you've got people overseas. Yes. You've got people in Sydney, Adelaide. What does fun look like? Uh, look, it's it's it, it's amazing uh, how you can create fun uh, in in a lockdown with Zoom and then some of the the games, the Zoom games, bingos, and things like that, or, or circulating questions and guessing who who whose answer belongs to the question and those sorts of things. Um, look, geographically in Adelaide, you now we we had the the, the fringe events uh, recently, so we you know we'll get together and we've got something in the diary to do every quarter, and so we're we're always going out having fun, and we make sure that we celebrate the mid year, we make sure we celebrate the end of year. 
partners are included. Um, and so we, we do go out and we, we do a lot of stuff together. We don't have anybody that uh, stands in the corner and says, no, thanks, I don't want to come. Everybody wants to, to come along because if they don't come, we talk about them. <laughs> so if you're not listening, we're talking about you as we speak. <laughs> um, in relation to uh, the, the business, yep. I want to move to vision for the future. Now, it's not every day that someone comes in here and says that they want to get five times the size that they are. What steps and what vision have you got to do that? That's the first question. And then how the hell are you going to build an operations team behind you Mm. that's not going to go insane? This is where you need to partner with somebody. Uh, And so the fact that we've got a licensee, I don't have to do that myself, and the fact that we've got an equity partner uh, that can stump up capital and debt um, gives us that infrastructure so a bit of a as triangle well. there. Look, look, it is. You've got, to, you've got to line these ducks up to make sure that you can achieve these things. And, and even if we don't achieve it, you've got to aim for something. Um, so we say that to the clients, unless you've got an end game. And I never had one. So to have something now, it's, it's, it's a bit daunting to, to put those sorts of numbers on a, on a presentation, but they're there. And uh, whether we achieve it or not, we, we, no, we won't die wondering. And so, but you've got to actually get your infrastructure right first. And as you grow and evolve, then you can change that. But if it becomes your habit, your annual habit, where you're you're rechecking what you're doing and and how do you improve it, and how do you restructure it? No, there's no reason you can't get that big. And um, just to confirm, you, you're no longer client facing at all. You've 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 you, you basically you've embraced the the leadership. Um, as a, a true profession, uh, yes, it's interesting. I, I went to a, a conference last year, and I think you know, the average number of clients per advisor was eighty-eight around Australia on average. And I know it, it's what came first, the chicken or the egg. I, I know I looked after ninety, and I was running Pride. Um, and it's not to say I just saw people once a year. I was I was a hands-on um, advisor. I'm still getting referrals now. Um, so the fact that you're doing something right, you don't have to over overcomplicate things. You know, it can be a trick to sort of say, well, I want to charge X, so therefore I need to do four things a, a year just to justify the fees. That's not what FASI is all about. So you know, when you're doing stuff for a client, you know, it should be set there so that you don't have to be catching up every month and reporting it. If they want to, that's fine, but it is a value for money. Um, so I, I had 90 clients, but it was getting to a point for me last year where it was just, it was too much. I couldn't provide my clients that active service 24 hour turnaround because at a minute's notice I could be in Sydney or I could be doing something else. And so uh, at, at a cost of the business, I brought another advisor on Astrid. She's brilliant. Um, so I tried to find somebody that would align, um, with my, my client base. I think, you know, if you're running a business well, I think you, you, you get a, a tribe of clients that are similar um, because they, they get attracted to you as the advisor and your personality. So I was able to find somebody that um, was similar to me in the way that she, she presented. And so as a result, it makes it easier for clients to resonate with her, and which has allowed me to sort of step away to grow pride. And um, leads me to my question around what, what do you see as the vision for the future of of practice management or running practices in financial services in Australia? This is the exciting thing about being in, in this profession. I know financial services, you know, the accountants have been around forever, lawyers have been around forever, mortgage brokers are doing their stuff, but financial planning is that newest profession. And, and whereas the planner was everything, I think in order to, to lift the number of clients that you're seeing from 88 to 200, you need to be able to rely on support staff to do their part. And you know, if you're charging out an advisor hourly rate to do CSO type work or reception type work or check the mail, how is that in the client's best interest? You need to grow to be able to do a proper cost to serve to bring that price down to make sure clients are getting value for money. And you can only do that by growing. And I suppose that's to your point. As far as you know, your your vision of of, of how you're going to grow in the future, you you were you're looking to attract like-minded individuals yep. who potentially share the same vision for the client experience, but um, have the self-awareness that they're not at scale at the moment and they would be looking to move into your operational rhythm and system. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. It doesn't work. if You, you, can't, you can't run four different styles of back office. You have to have the one. And uh, now whether whether That's we a very would, Henry Ford comment whether we would merge into to the way that they operate or whether they merge into the way we operate that stuff needs to be flushed out before you do the deal so now that stuff's a, a given but I think for people that are just one or two person practices you know I, I've, I've I've suffered in my life I've been beaten up I've had epilepsy I've, I've had a son I've lost a son I've lost a business partner and you know, these things happen we do pro bono work for one of the local hospitals for for cancer patients. 
how is it in your client's best interest if you're the only advisor in that business and something happens to you? Agreed. So, you know, to be a professional, you've got to behave professionally, and that means de-risking um, the things that could impact your clients should something happen to you, and you can only do that by getting bigger. Well, that's that's a, a you know a really heartfelt and and real life raw example, and for anyone's listening who is going on this journey, that's that's got to be your purpose. Mm. Uh, a critical comment that you made there is that that you owe it to your clients and your team that that you need to be able to be replaceable as well. Um, as as vulnerable as it sounds, uh, the best quality leaders work out early on how to become irrelevant and then start that march. Yeah, and it's really it's interesting with financial services because you have to be licensed. So it's one thing to say, oh, it's okay, I've got to deal with uh, the, the, the advisor in the next suburb. No, we, we've got this quid quid pro quo that we're each other's succession that if I couldn't work for three months then know that that advisor is going to pick up and, and look after my clients like a, like a locum in, in medicine yeah but but what about licensing now yeah. if you're a different license are you going to charge your client or are you going to ch- is, is that new advisor who's licensed differently going to charge an SOA fee <laughs> Um, how is that in the client's best interest? So it, it's quite unique. So if you're going to do this stuff and stay single, that's fine, but find somebody inside your license that could pick up and, and take off where you've left left off as well. But if you're not operating under a car model, how do you do that as well? So now you've got to think of the intricacies of how do you actually give this advice in an effective and efficient manner to your client that's cost effective. There'd be some licensees listening. Um, and, and what I'd urge is, is that that's a really profound comment. If uh, we're all, uh, you know, licensees are, are all competing um, uh, to to work with the best practices, but potentially having a solution for that comment around um, uh, almost a locum within that licensee hmm. who was available um, might be. I've never, I've never heard of it. Might yeah. actually be a, a real point of difference. I don't know how you do it, but maybe you could go to the regulator and then have some sort of sandboxing where you're saying this is what this is the risk we're trying to solve for clients. I, I can't see the regulator not wanting to 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 try that out. Um, but I think it's something, if we're going to stay with smaller practices around Australia, then we need to solve for those risks. And how is it that we as a profession do that? What a great comment. I mean, look, that's just opened a Pandora's box. And, and absolutely, it, it's, it's, it's really working for the client. And, and as you've said, um, going to the regulator um, and, uh, and saying, here's the problem. We need your permission for a solution is probably the most logical thing that I've heard in a long time. Yeah, because we, we can't be dual licensed either. So you know, the, the licensing regime itself sort of is an impediment to making sure we're looking after our clients on an ongoing basis. But in their defence, they're managing the risk, which is which is spiralling. So it's hard for them to be as flexible as what we want them to be as well. Yeah, and so I suppose you no. Know, hopefully, we get to that point where a bit like uh, the doctors and, and the lawyers and the accountants. You now, there's a there's, a, there's a, an element of self regulation in that. No, we need to we need to earn that trust, um, but we're in that period that where where we're moving from point A to point B, and so what do we do in the meantime if we can identify these risks? Um, how do we solve for them? And you mentioned then um, earning trust, and I suppose I'd like to end with the, the the comment of thank you very much for your time. Part of um, increasing the professionalism um, of financial advice and, 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 and actually the evolution of practice management is all about building a trusted environment for people to not just earn the trust of their colleagues, but also to earn the trust of our other stakeholder, which is the general public. Absolutely. And if we do that, then our legacy in 2023, in, in 10 years' time, will be, will be entirely valuable for the next generation. Brett, I'd love to thank you for your time and your candour, and um, I look forward to uh, chatting again. Um, and for those of you guys, um, lots of information about Pride um, can be put on, on our attachments, and I look forward to catching you very soon. Cheers, Brett. Thanks, Rocky.